Good afternoon and welcome to today's Ad Week webinar, Grow Your Funnel in a Post-Cookie Landscape, where we'll be talking about how to boost conversions and loyalty with first-party data. Today's webinar is sponsored by Acquia. I'm Danielle Moore, here with Ad Week's Content Studio, and I'll be your host today. Before we begin, I just want to take a minute to make sure everyone knows what to expect from today's webinar and is familiar with the features of our platform here. The actual presentation should go somewhere in the 35 to 40 minute range, after which we will have some time for audience Q&A. So if at any point you have a question for one of our speakers here, just use that Q&A tool beneath the video window on your screen, and we'll get to as many questions as we can after the end of the presentation. Also, it's not too late to invite your colleagues to join us on today's webinar. About 15 minutes ago, you received a final reminder email from us. In there, you'll find a link to the webinar registration page that you can share with your colleagues. There's still plenty of time for them to join us live today, but if they can't, today's webinar is being recorded and they can always catch that on-demand version. In fact, the on-demand recording will be available to all registrants. We'll be sending you a link to that later today when it's live around 3.30 Eastern or so. And if you would like a PDF of today's slide deck, you can find that in the event resources area on your screen beneath the video window. As always, if you enjoyed today's webinar, definitely check out the full Adweek webinars calendar at adweek.com slash webinars. You'll see what we have coming up and also get access to our archive of on-demand events as well. You can find that link along with links to Adweek's resource library and micro learning videos in the event resources area as well. So if you're looking for other great resources to sharpen your skills, be sure to check those out. Now, we've got a lot of great content to dive into today. So without further ado, let me bring our speakers up on screen here to introduce themselves and get us started. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hi there. Hello, and thank you so much, Danielle, for having us. Um, we'll get started with introductions. As I'm Jake Athey, the VP of Marketing and Sales for Acquia's Marketing Solutions, including CDP, Dam, and PIM. And I'm joined by three incredible panelists here today from uh, our partners. And so, Joanna, Raquel, and Jason, would you please introduce yourselves? Starting with you, Joanna. Hi. Yeah, I'm Joanna May. I'm with VML YNR. I work between um, the MarTech marketing technology space and technology implementation and strategy. I've been with VML. YNR for 10 years, and I'm excited to be here today. Great. Um, my name is Raquel Platt. I come from the <coughs> Wear Aware team, um, where my team specializes in the development and activation of integrated marketing plans throughout the omni-channel um, funnels, and super excited to talk to you all today and get a bunch of uh, questions answered around the deprecation of cookies. Thanks for having me. And I am Jason Hamrick, and I lead the customer data and insights practice at Phase 2. We're a digital agency that's rooted in deepening our clients' understanding of their customers across the entire digital landscape. My practice encompasses data strategy, implementation of data pipelines, and the analysis of that data that helps clients optimize their digital investments. I'm so happy to be here. Thanks, Jake. All right, thank you all for introducing yourself. We're so excited to have this conversation, this opportunity here with all of you, with our panel of experts to discuss how you can grow your funnel in a post-cookie apocalypse, post-cookie landscape, and uh, boost conversions and loyalty with first-party data. And so let, let's get into what we're going to discuss here today. So we've got five main parts to our webinar to discuss the types of data and, and why we need to talk about the data here today. We'll talk about the shortcomings of third-party cookies. We'll also get into why the deprecation of third-party cookies is an opportunity for marketers to deliver better customer experiences. And we'll talk more about trends in rethinking customer experience and how to get started with your first-party data strategy to grow your funnel in a post-cookie landscape. And so with that, in part one, we introduce yourselves. We want to introduce ourselves to this topic of data and the types of data that marketers gather, manage, and use, and just why this matters. And so let's warm up with a little bit of a crash course in the different types of data. So as you know, cookies are important to how the internet operates. You know, users pass information to a browser or a server and back to users again. And cookies are the files stored on your computer designed to hold a small specific amount of data about a particular website or individual. And the main purpose 
of a cookie is to identify the user so their web experience can be more personalized. And similarly, a domain cookie is a cookie that's associated directly with the domain of origin. And so first party cookies are stored under the same domain that is uh, that a user is currently visiting, whereas third party cookies are cookies that are stored under a different domain than the one that the user is interacting with. And so the host or domain owner <coughs> of the cookie determines which kind of data type is collected. And so that brings us to the four types of data. We have zero party data, which is data that is self-reported and voluntary and addresses such things as communication preferences. Uh, for example, a customer may fill out a form um, or a survey stating that they'd like to receive a weekly newsletter. So that's zero party data. And then first party data is data required to complete a transaction. It's, it's gathered by uh, tracking and, and observing user behaviors on a website and interpreted by marketers to build out segmentation and targeting efforts. And then we have second party data, which, which is um, the same as first party data, but sourced from a partner. It's data that the organization collects uh, from its audience and sells to another partner company. And it's nearly the same, uh, but again, sourced from a partner. And then third party data. And that is data outside your organization and typically collected by web cookie tracking from multiple sources such as browsing and advertising. And it's created by websites other than the one that you are currently visiting uh, in a domain, not the one that you are currently on. <clears throat> so with that as uh, a baseline for the differences between say zero party and first party and, and third party data, we get to why does this matter? And so as you've probably seen in the headlines now over the last couple of years, Major web browsers like Google Chrome, Apple Safari, and, and Mozilla Firefox are phasing out and blocking third-party cookies. And it's known as the cookie-less future or the cookie apocalypse mm -hmm. and the death of the third-party cookie. And uh, while this has been uh, uh, pushed a few times, uh, Google, for example, is currently set to phase out third-party cookies in its Chrome browser by the end of the year. And this comes after a few delays as, as Google wants us as marketers to have more time to adjust to the new advertising approaches. And that's why we're so excited to be here today and meet with you and have this panel discussion as our panel of experts are here to discuss the shortcomings of third party cookies and why this event is an opportunity for marketers like yourselves to deliver better experiences and also how to go about designing your first party data strategy to grow your funnel and boost conversions and customer loyalty. So we've got a lot to cover here today in the next 50 minutes as we get into our second part, which is really talking about the shortcomings of third party cookies. And so now I'm going to open it up to our panelists to share their points of view and their experiences <clears throat> and lessons learned, starting with our first question panel. Uh, what are the problems or the shortcomings of third-party cookies in gaining customer trust and insight across the journey? So take it away. Yeah, I can jump in if that's okay. Um, third-party cookies and third-party tracking, it's not all bad. It's just the sheer number of them that I think we as customers, as people who are traveling on the web, we that we interact with. I, uh, like a lot of you, I went to view an uh, article at a magazine, online magazine, and 800 separate marketing tags fired as I was reading one article. So as customers, like we're just bombarded with all these advertisements that sour that experience. We know it's happening. We know it's happening invisibly. And it puts us in this defensive posture when we're navigating the web. Then as marketers and publishers, that poor experience weakens our brands, but we've made the decision that the trade-off has you know, been worth it. I think with the, with the rise of privacy and consent management and the rise of ad blockers, the metrics, the data that we have been getting from third-party providers is less valuable. So there's this place where that trade-off, that calculus we've been making over the, over the years, uh, is starting to change a little bit. Yeah, I would agree. I think this, the marketing strategy behind using third-party data and vendors was always based on the idea that we're sharing customer data with other vendors 
not mm -hmm. with the company itself. And customers have now become more attuned to that those methods. And I think there's a level of discomfort about that, not knowing how that data is going to be used. I mean, the word cookie to some extent has become a bit of a trigger word. People see the, the notice and go, I don't, I don't know what those are, or I know enough about what those are that I don't, I don't think I want that. And so I think that like you're saying, Jason, the value exchange of um, accepting or consenting to this long list of unknowns with regards to customer data is changing. But to some extent, even for companies and businesses, that was always data being shared with other vendors, not not mm -hmm. owned personally and not utilized in a straightforward in a straightforward way. Yeah, I would agree with that, Joanne. And I think, um, Joanna, one of the things that you're summarizing there is really the lack in transparency. So when people do see, you know, do you accept the cookies? Um, it usually just is a splash on a page where it's a yes or a no, but there's really no definition of what they're getting in return for sharing that data. So really, I think today consumers, to your point, they're pushing back against sharing that data because they're not sure how it's being used. And to your point, in the past, when they've shared it with you know one particular website, it ends up being used against them in other places that they wouldn't expect and that they don't want it to be used. All right, yeah, thank you so much for, uh, for sharing some of the, the, uh, you know, the takes on the problems and shortcomings of third-party data. And so let's talk uh, more about just how does data privacy impact your marketing campaigns and customer experiences? And so what's, what's the different points of view on that one? Jason. Yeah, I think, you know, we're at this place now where it's just part of that, the exchange, the calculus and the, the math behind that exchange keeps changing, right? Like uh, with the rise of different data privacy regulations, the rise of ad blockers. And now instead of, instead of ad blockers being uh, extension that you add to your browser, now they're all baked in. Um, the rise of data privacy, the importance of consent, it it both makes the data less valuable because some of the people who are savvy enough to know how to turn off, uh, turn on ad blockers and turn off trackers are likely the same sorts of people who you would normally want to attract. Um, <clears throat> at the same time though, it, it gives us this opportunity to rethink how we are talking about customer data. Um, the, we are now at this place where customer data can and should be seen as something that customers lend to us rather than something that we take from them. So what does that mean for how we as marketers approach clients, approach customers? Um, it, it opens up a whole bunch of opportunity, uh, but it starts with that impact of just changing that calculus. Well said. Yeah, I really like the point on, on it's it's something customers lent to us and should be treated as such. So, mm -hmm. right. Well, that's a good warm up to the topic and, and, and gives us you know, some context as to just what are the shortcomings of third party cookies. So let's talk about why this is an opportunity in, in, our, in part three here. We want to talk about why the decline of third party <laughs> cookies is an opportunity for us as marketers to, to really uh, shift and, and evolve the the way we go to market and the customer experiences that we create. And so um, uh, let's talk about why should people switch from thinking about cookies to thinking about data? And uh, I think Joanna, you touched on it uh, a bit earlier, but you want to elaborate? Yeah, I'm a big advocate for this because the, the market is changing, the marketing technology, the ad tech is changing, mm -hmm. and it's changing to more of a customer centric viewpoint. And I think that our strategies need to evolve as well towards the idea that what is our customer data collection strategy, as opposed to how many vendors can we get to do stuff with their things that they do? You know, it is, it is moving much more towards having an intentional, um, curated, crafted customer data um, strategy about 
who are my customers? What is the data that that I can that they can lend to me that we can utilize with a value exchange? What can I give them in return for the data that they're providing? What are the policies in place to help them maintain ownership and um, consent of that data? And so, I mean, that I think that's the mindset that that we as in marketing and in advertising and in technology need to start shifting towards out of this like vendor cookie strategy into a crafted customer data um, with intentionality, consent, and, and strategy perspective. Yeah, um, I think you nailed it on the head, Joanna. It really is about leading to more of a personalized and privacy-focused approach for your advertising. Um, and it really does open up a opportunity for us to think a little bit differently of how we go to market. Um, it also is challenging people and companies like Google to develop new advertising methodologies. Um, Google has privacy sandbox initiative, um, and I'm sure there's going to be more following suit where you are able to target people just in a different way. Um, obviously, I think it, it, I'm maybe getting the cart before the horse here, but like it could be the rebirth of some older advertising methodologies, like <laughs> in um, which I'm sure we're going to hit on in a moment. But so it really is taking a look to see what across what you're doing today is working and how do you shift that with more of a, again, privacy focus um, and personalized focus when speaking to your customers. Because Joanne, exactly what you said, it is it has to be consumer centric and their expectations are greater than ever. Yeah. I don't, I don't think we can overstate the importance, Joanna. You said this word, you said intentionality. Mm -hmm. I think that's going to be the driving factor. Like, how does the data that I am collecting help me reach a business goal? Can I collect, can I connect an individual data element to an organizational goal? Or think about that the other way. What are my business goals and what pieces of data do I need to collect to help me meet those business goals and collect only those? I think there's, rather than just collecting everything, I mean, in the old world, we just collect everything and then figure out what to do with it later. Oh, we'll stick it in the data lake. And then in a couple of years, we'll have enough that we can make some decisions. Now we need to be more intentional. We need to think about organizational goals, product goals, KPIs, and how each of those connects to an individual piece of customer data. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, J Jason and, and, and team. Uh, uh, speaking of intentionality, uh, just what opportunities do you see with building first party data strategies? What, what, are, what are you uh, doing with some of your customers that stands out to, to give our audience some things to think about there as, as far as opportunities for building first party data strategies? Yeah, I think one of the things that you need to look at are what are the different touch points that your brand has with your customer. Um, so for many years, we've all been relying on that third party data, even though mm -hmm. we've been collecting some, some consumer um, data along the way, we haven't been paying as much attention to it as we probably should. Um, and realistically, um, for all all the reasons that we've already suggested, the third party data just really isn't as accurate as first party data. It could either be outdated. Um, it's really one silo of browser only versus when you're looking across the different touch points that you have with your, your customer, that could be offline. It could be online. So it could be at a trade show. It could be while they're in your, you know, and mortar. It could be when they're filling out their account information. Um, if you have a contest that they're entering, um, it could be when they're downloading a white paper or even the content that they're um, absorbing on your website. So you have multiple points, emails that they're opening, um, what links within the emails are they engaging with? So there's a, a plethora of different information that you can pull in. Um, and Really, if they're serving it up to you, they find it valuable for you to have it. And so mm -hmm. they want you to use it at that point. So I would look across all, you know, your full marketing ecosystem and figure out where am I having these conversations with my customers? And at what point does it make sense for me to ask for more of that information? Yeah. Can I expand on that, Raquel? I think you hit the nail on the head. Yeah. And even looking at data beyond your marketing data. I mean, one of the things that we found is that 
different departments inside the organization own different parts of the customer journey. You know, marketing owns the outreach data. Comms and content might own you know, web engagement or mobile app engagement. Fundraising owns you know, revenue and those kind of metrics. Uh, sales owns info in the CRM and what actually happens downstream real close to the sale. So rather than uh, thinking about uh, data as just something that the marketer is, owns and has access to, look around your organization, talk to people, figure out what's out there, understand the entire customer experience, and what assets do you already have inside the organization? I think for us, that's the thing that we've seen is it's is this shift to first party data has opened up huge opportunities for collaboration inside clients, inside their organizations, help them de-silo, break down those barriers, budget barriers, political barriers. Like, oh, this is my data, I own it, you can't see it. You know, just breaking down those barriers and really getting to a place where as an organization, we are all aligned to serving the customer, to meeting those needs. Uh, it's really exciting. Yeah, thank you so much, Jason and, and, and Raquel, for sharing some of the opportunities that you see with building first party data strategies. Um, and as we move on, we want to shift to just how can you rethink the customer experience? And so uh, outside of first party data, what other opportunities exist to improve customer experience? Uh, for example, is it contextual advertising? Uh, and is that making a comeback in this post cookie world or programmatic advertising? So, uh, uh, panelists, what do you think of that? Well, I'll speak to the contextual <laughs> first. <laughs> I'm just a chat in here. Um, and so I do think contextual for anybody that hasn't started already. Um, you, of course, there's a lot of companies out there that haven't even started to collect the first party data. And part of that um, in growing it is figuring out what can we learn from other marketing mediums. And contextual is certainly a place where you can find out what are my customers resonating with. Um, obviously, you know, with machine learning, we now have a better um, way to to serve up contextual content to them um, because they it's not just a single keyword. It's really more about a phrase in the context in which the phrase is being used. And so where some people shied away from contextual um, advertising in the past, it's a lot smarter than what it used to be. So give it another chance. Um, and as you're growing your first party data, you can see what what are people really researching? What are they truly interested in? What content um, are they wanting to receive from us from a brand, but also what other things interest them? So you don't 100% have to rely on first party data at one at any given point, even when you build um, this mountainous database. But um, there are still other advertising methodologies that will work for you in concert with those. Yeah, I think, Raquel, you mentioned this earlier, kind of back to the future and a lot of these older approaches are going to come back in vogue, in vogue. Joanna, you mentioned some of these earlier. Like, I think we're going to see as opportunities the return of content marketing, uh, the return, mm -hmm. the reemergence of reputation management and word of mouth marketing as approaches. And really, like, the big idea behind all of those is that for marketers and publishers to really think about what value am I providing my customers in exchange for their data? Right? Each of those things, you know, contextual content, reputation, it's all about a fair exchange. Um, that's, a, that's an opportunity for marketers, publishers to reset the relationship you've had with your customers around data, around privacy, so it feels less adversarial, it feels more collaborative. It feels more like I'm giving you something of value. Uh, let's work together and serve both of our needs. Uh, that's even just just you know, conceptually, ethically, it's, it, it opens up a whole lot of different avenues and opportunities that weren't open in a third party world where the impetus is just, let me gather everything I have and, and I'll figure out how to use it later. Yeah, very well said. Um, 
building on that, um, how can AI and ML impact marketing campaigns? Oh. <clears throat> Jason? Well, yeah. I think a lot of us have talked around this, and Raquel, you just mentioned ML especially, but I think there's an opportunity to see smarter, more precise audience segmentation that's based on behaviors and not demographics. Um, that's really exciting. Smarter drip campaigns, smarter re-engagement campaigns, targeting your most valuable customers, and probably just as importantly, being able to leave people alone sometimes because you know they're not a valuable part of the segment. You know, I would, you know, I'm a uh, cyclist and I would love to get a quarterly email or a direct mail piece that was really targeted to me. Like, here's the bike you own, here's the, a helmet, Here's all your favorite rides in your area. These new trails are opening up. You know, I would love to see that. And then other than that, be kind of left alone. Um, yeah, and I, I was think just AI and can, can power that. I'm sorry, Raquel. No, yeah, um, I was just going to agree with you. And I think, too, um, machine learning, AI, one of the things, if you think about some of the, the new ad um, <clears throat> initiatives that, whether it be Google or anybody else, where they say, just give us the individual assets and we'll keep doing the algorithm until we figure out what, mm -hmm. what works best for you, right? Um, and so they're doing that for us today. But once you get your data in place, and you start to be able to collect that data and put it into the right um, the right systems in order for your group, your company to have that same manipulation of the data, to have those same learnings. You can then figure out at what point does it at what point in the journey does it make sense for me to share this message with the customer mm -hmm. or should it be later? And so as you set up your data collection, which I know we're going to talk about what, what's the right process to do that, part of it is setting it up in a way that you're not only collecting the data, but that you're <clears throat> able to visualize the data in a way that's informative to better serve your customers at the point in time in which they are. So I think the machine learning works on our end as brand ambassadors too. Yeah, I, I have to say, I am really excited about the potential for AI and machine learning when it comes to these kind of marketing automation decisioning engines, but mm -hmm. it, it's not gonna solve um, for organizations like poor technology choices or non not having centralized customer data or not having done the hard work of defining yeah. like the customer data collection set. And to some extent, if, if we don't get on it now, to some extent of doing the hard work of selecting, you know, we're seeing the emergence of, you know, customer data platforms as, as, as an entity, as, a, as an idea of where all of your customer data, behavioral attributes, point of sale, transactional data, it's a central place for that customer centric data collection to be housed and actioned off of but that's infrastructure you know it takes investment mm -hmm. it takes strategy it takes time it takes some dollars but you're not going to be able to benefit from these these wild acceleration in ai and machine learning algorithms for these opportunities in the future if that infrastructure isn't in place for your organization yeah, well said, Joanna. And, and, and to, to help our, our audience more there, what are some of the uh, processes, the, the policies and procedures of collecting and managing data uh, in ways that will, will really help us rethink and, and reimagine and, and deliver better customer experiences? I'll jump on this one too. I'm really passionate about customer data and I'm really passionate about people having the customers themselves having a, a stake in the game finally with what happens to the data. And I think to some extent in the past, maybe some advertising and marketing, the perspective has been, this is a legal thing, or this is the fine print that nobody has read in years that exists in the like footer copy in the smallest possible font on our website somewhere, and we don't really know. But this has got to become a value. Um, it's, it's already become a value for customers. It needs to become a value for marketers that we're clearly communicating what the data we're collecting, where we're housing it, that we're, mm -hmm. you know, 
paying attention to the evolution of, you know, policies, procedures, and laws, GDPR, people have the expectation that I can rescind the consent of my data. Is it really being deleted? Are we honoring the right to be forgotten for users, you know, consented data, that there's systems in place to then remove it and to purge it? And to kind of think about customers in a way that their data life cycle makes sense for businesses. So there are there are businesses for whom it, it really doesn't, it's not appropriate to maintain someone's personal data to infinity and beyond. You know, they're only in your world for a certain time frame for a certain reason. And, and to put those pieces in place to support that customer centric, honoring the consent and allowing it to actually be removed from the system. And having that perspective in mind, I think is, is really important and moves checking the box of policies, procedures, and legal things that are trending mm -hmm. around the world into a value. And I think customers will appreciate that value if it becomes part of our advertising models. Yeah. And, and that value can be a differentiator, right? There's, you, Jake, you asked about policies and procedures. Uh, Joanna, you talked about really a, a mental shift. And at the, at the core of that mental shift is changing the relationship your, of how you think about the customer data. You said, you know, make it easy to collect and to rescind. I think that is vitally important. Equally as easy to rescind the consent as it was to give in the first place. Um, I think there's a world in, in which the mental shift for marketers in this space is to understand that your compliance team are actually equal shareholders in this conversation, right? They can bring a lot of value. Um, they can make sure you're serving your needs, your organization's needs, the compliance and regulatory needs. Um, so as we, as we think about specific policies and procedures, all of those need to be wrapped, I think, in, in those two ideas. The compliance is an equal shareholder uh, and stakeholder in these conversations, and that it should be as easy to rescind, delete, uh, give back that data that was loaned as it was to collect it in the first place. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing your your, your points on uh, the topic of policies and procedures. And so, so with that, I think that leads its way into you know, how do we get started and, and some of the, the, the systems uh, uh, components of that. And so in this final section here today, before we have some time for audience Q&A, uh, we want to talk more about how to craft an effective first party data strategy. And, and uh, we'll get into some of the technologies that are aiming to support that. Um, uh, and, and before we do, let me just open it up to, to the panelists here. Um, what, what are some of your, your, your tips for how to craft an effective first party data strategy? I'm, I'm just going to throw one thing out there and I'm sure my panelists have a lot to say about it, but I would take the crawl, walk, run approach. And so I know mm -hmm. that I got excited about the machine learning and the AI, but to Joanna's point, if we don't have the right methodology set up to correct, to collect um, really clean data, you're not going to have a good um, a good foundation to do much with the data. So um, I'll just start there and and just say start slow. Um, make sure that you have the right systems in place. And I know Jason and Joanna, you're going to talk about a couple of those things. But um, I would just you know start slow, crawl, walk, run, and then once you feel like you're in a good spot, you can continue to add on to it. Yeah, we're talking about both the the mental shift, the mind shift change, and then mm -hmm. kind of the systems that can support support the marketing automation with this new perspective. Um, I think for the idea that customer data and a customer data set um, isn't just a marketing, it's not just marketing data. You know, it's not, mm -hmm. this, we were talking earlier, Jason, about the internal silos that businesses often have. They often have lots of customer data, but it's strewn across lots of touch points. But your customers shouldn't be victim to the silos of your internal organization, right? You know, like it isn't just marketing data. There's point of sale data. There might be customer service interactions, CRM, relationship, email, <clears throat> you know, thinking about that collection of customer 
touch points holistically within an organization is I think a great place to start with saying, we got to figure out a customer data strategy, not a marketing data, not a website Mm -hmm. data, not app interaction data, but customer data that really encompasses all of those touch points. I think the other thing I would, I would love for um, my stakeholders to really embrace and understand is that everybody knows in internally in your team, what we know about our customers. And even if it's only a few things that, uh, that cross those touch points, that there's a, there's a shared internal like lexicon of customer data that we, we all know what we know about our customers. And as we grow that, you know, attributes or um, behaviors that it is shared across a team. I think that's a, also a great mental place and practical place to start when when crafting a customer data strategy. Maybe you have 15 attributes against a, a unique customer, but cross the touch points, cross the systems with those attributes, figure out an architecture that holds them together in a, in a place that can be actioned in real time and and bring stakeholders from your organization together to recognize the distinction between you know marketing data or advertising data or mm-hmm. you know third party you know campaign data to truly customer centric data i support everything you just said that was that was incredibly well said uh, any data that can give you insight into your audiences can be useful uh, aligning that data to product goals, to organizational goals, organizational goals, uh, which are often not driven by a single quarter or two quarters of, of business, but those are long-term goals. Um, understanding which of those are important and equally understanding which of those data points are not important to your business and having a plan to offload those. You know, there's part of starting to craft that strategy is, is to understand what goes inside the Venn diagram and what stays out. Speaking of what data matters most, uh, let's talk a little bit about what a, what a customer data platform can do. And, and uh, I'll share a bit more, uh, you know, on just what, what is a CDP relative to some of the other systems uh, for managing your customer experience and customer data. And, and then we'll talk more about different ways of collecting and, and, and using this data with the CDP. And so uh, for those that are uh, unfamiliar with, with, with the landscape of customer data platforms, this is a type of software that is built to collect and unify data across channels and systems and really to help create that single source of truth for customer data. And so it can pull together zero party, first party, third party data to build that comprehensive or 360 degree view of your customer profiles and update them in real time. Um, And so CDPs allow you to collect data, unify customer profiles, understand your customer segments and really put that data to work as you deliver more uh, more effective customer experiences. And um, now CDPs can help organize and enable the analysis of uh, things like demographics, geographics, device and channel preferences, purchase history, browsing or email behavior, uh, and then also things like uh, lifetime value, propensity to change, likelihood to buy, next best product or channel, and likelihood to churn. So these are all valuable insights to marketers when when they can be accessed and and, and leveraged uh, effectively with first-party data. Uh, And so CDPs really offer that ability to collect data from all sources, unify profiles for each of your customers, and your customer segments, and then um, activate campaigns and uh, deliver some of those analytical insights um, with the support of ML to help really understand that customer data. Uh, And we're also asked, what's the difference um, between, say, CDPs and CRMs? And so know that, uh, and I think Jason touched on the CRM systems are really built for sales to manage direct personal interactions and and, and not designed to facilitate the personalized customer experiences across all channels. And uh, while customer data lives in a CRM, it also lives in email service providers, social uh, communities, commerce, customer review sites, and, and so on. And so um, brands need that, that analytical CRM, and that's really what a CDP uh, is, was born to do. Uh, we also talked, and I know we mentioned data lakes, and many organizations uh, you know, keep their data in data lakes, and a data lake holds 
that raw unstructured data uh, until it is needed for various business purposes. And while this can be useful uh, repository, uh, a repository for data, it doesn't really solve the challenge of helping marketers uh, directly access, analyze, or activate clean data. And so that's what a CDP is for. Uh, it's not to ingest all forms of data, but to um, uh, manage the clean data that comes in and, and can organize into something manageable for a variety of teams across the organization. So hopefully that gives you a sense of just what a CDP is and does and how it compares to some of the other systems you're using. And so to wrap up with the two, uh, two remaining questions as part of this section, uh, panelists, what are some of the different ways of collecting that data and, and how do I get it? Uh, and how do I get customers to share it with me uh, willingly? And so uh, let's go. Let's go there, Raquel. Sorry, I wasn't sure if I was on mute. Um, I think I touched on this a little bit earlier, just um, talking really all around the ways in which you have different touch points with your customers. Um, so just really, again, continue to look at what that journey is and, and where are the real opportunities for you to focus on having them share that that additional information. And to both Jason and Joanna's point, it's not just the marketing touch points. Um, there's a lot of other information that you can collect from them. It's, you know, how often do they purchase from you? Um, it's really, again, about how are they integrating with your or engaging with your brand, it, even if it's not um, some of the marketing tactics, but what are they doing online? What are they doing within the stores? What are the conversations that they're having with your sales team? But also um, finance, uh, also on, again, the product side, what are they doing? How are they experiencing your brand throughout all the different touch points? Um, and I know um, a couple of you have experience with gamification. Um, so there's really unique ways that you can also um, become engaged with your audience. It doesn't have to be the traditional marketing tactics. Um, you can become more um, uh, more creative in how you how you approach them. Um, there's also the opportunity to have partners um, where you are sharing information as long as you're being transparent. Um, and that you share with the your customer that you are partnering to share that that data and that the data will be shared between the two uh, different brands. So there's there's a couple of unique unique ways in which you can approach the data collection piece. Again, it's all around <laughs> making sure that you're being compliant with privacy, um, but also being transparent with the end user. Jason, Joanna, did you have anything to add? Yeah. Uh, well, I was just thinking totally anecdotally, you know, my my personal as a consumer, you know, my frustration with my own experience as a shopper with ads, with business relationships, I it's not that that I don't like giving away my data. It's really that I have really high expectations for the the one to one marketing, for the personalization experience, for the for for the remarketing experience. I don't know if you've ever experienced purchasing something and then seeing it somewhere else, and you've already purchased it. You know, I get frustrated when the ad tech isn't really smart and it isn't really informed, and they actually haven't asked for enough. Um, of my information to really tailor marketing to me. And I think to myself, you know, if they knew a little bit more about me in this specific area, they could really give me those ads that are going to, are going to get me, you know? And so I think to some extent, and, and I'm a, you know, high technology consumer, but to some extent, I think across the board, you know, if we're meeting customers with, um, with those one-to-one -one experiences and showing them with our marketing campaigns and our actions and our infrastructure and our technology that the data that you are giving us, we're going to value and utilize, iterate on it and make it better and, and, and do more with it. And I, I think to some extent, as we see companies and organizations shift to that, um, I think collecting data is going to be something that it's a value exchange and you prove that you do well, do well with it. And consumers are going to give you the specific demographic information so that they have a better experience with your brand and with your company. I think that's 100% right. Jake, you started this by asking, how do we get customers to give us the data? 
And what Raquel and Joanna basically said is, what are you giving them in return? What's the trade? Are you making it useful? <clears throat> are you making it seamless and personal and sometimes invisible? Really good ad tech is invisible. It doesn't feel like I'm being marketed to. It feels like my need is being met. Joanna, you mentioned uh, buying something and then seeing it. Like, I just bought a mattress. I'm not going to buy another one. I just did that, you know? Um, something we, that strangely we often see, right? I just made this purchase on Amazon and now I'm going to get followed around for the next month of the ads of the thing I just bought, uh, which can be frustrating. And to your point, the ad tech needs to be better. Part of that means it's going to be powered by first party data, by zero party data. So what are we giving them in return? How are we going to make their lives easier? How are we going to meet them where they are with a personalized experience that's truly personalized and not just really small segmentations? Mm. Yeah, I, I agree with that too. Um, I think one of the things ad tech is great, um, but I do think you also have to recognize when can you just ask for the information? When do you ask, like, have you bought that mattress? <laughs> like, <laughs> are, you know, are, are you enjoying these emails or would you like to update your preference? So I don't think, um, I think that they are open to you, um, to you asking those questions if they believe again, that they can trust you and that they're going to use it to better their experience with your brand. Um, I know we talked about this or turn it a little bit, but I do think that you know, we, we spoke integrated marketing to your point, Jason, and um, to your point, Joanna, customer centric, mm -hmm. it's always been super important, important to be successful. Um, and at this point where the customer, their expectations is heightened that if I'm giving you this information, I expect you to use it to your point, Joanna, to make it a more personalized experience. I also believe that, um, I think, uh, Joanna, you even said like the demographics, they're not as important anymore as the behavior. What are those triggers and what information are they seeking at the at that moment in time? And so it's it's less about the demographics. It's more about the behavioral. It's more about the attitudinal. It's understanding who they really are and what's meaningful to them and asking them sometimes what that is. If they're willing to share it, um, you can that you can be that much more personal personalized in your approach to marketing or just in any type of communication to them, even if it's post-sale, um, even mm -hmm. if it's in customer service follow-up throughout their journey to hopefully not only get them to be a repeat customer, but also an advocate of the brand. So being willing to build that relationship throughout this, the life cycle is just as important as it is in the beginning of it. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much, panelists, for, for sharing your, your, your insights and, and, uh, and perspectives on, on, on how, how to start. And so with that, with 10 minutes left, I, we've, got, we've got a number of questions that have come in from the audience. And so we wanted to uh, you know, give, uh, uh, give some time to, to, to answer some of these questions. And so we'll turn awesome. it back over to Danielle to, yes, to share some of these audience questions. Thank you all so much for those insights. As you mentioned, we do have time to take a couple questions here. We'll get to as many as we can over the next five to 10 minutes or so. Um, to our audience members, please know that if we don't have time to get to your question live today, we always make sure they get forwarded over to our sponsor so they have the possibility of uh, replying to you offline. Uh, a couple of quick reminders from Adweek. Today's webinar has been recorded and will be available on demand later this afternoon. We'll email everyone a link to that recording, so keep an eye out for it. And if you would like a copy of the slides, you can find a PDF of those in the event resources area on your screen. Now, let's dive into some of these questions. So our first question here, can data stored in a computer, such as a cookie, uh, follow users' navigation or browsing through other websites? Any thoughts on that? Um. Yeah, I believe that's the sort of the essence of third-party cookies. Um, that a cookie written on one site with one domain that's capturing whatever information the developer wants to put into that cookie can then be read by a second or a third or a fourth domain. So, in, in many ways, the the core of the kind of advertising we've been talking about 
is that experience, right. that trait of data. Yeah, definitely good to get some clarification on that. Stored until it's cleared. <laughs> Stored until it's cleared, yes. Awesome, great. Uh, our next question here. What will the impact, in your opinion, of course, um, to the advertising environment be once the Google Chrome changes take effect? Um, for instance, will ad prices come down? Um, do you think advertisers will reduce budgets? Will advertising on certain sites be less, less effective? Uh, and if so, which sites? Kind of a multi-part question, but would love any thoughts on that. I mean, I think it must, cookie, the cookie death occurs. <laughs> We've had the decline, the, the long tail decline. If we right. really see a death of the third party cookie, I think it will be very disruptive. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if we can define which disruptions will impact your business or ours or our partners, but it it will be very disruptive. I mean, there are, um, and I think Google is getting ahead of that in a lot of ways with some of their, we talked about some of their more algorithm based buys and, you know, there's, they're, they are, have been preparing for this. I think there will be different options for how advertisers spend their money with, um, with paid in the paid space. Uh, but, but in general, I think that if strategies are based on what will be the old model at that point, right. that there will be, you know, missed conversions, loss in revenue, not seeing as, eff as effective strategies that may have occurred 10 years prior when that was kind of the, the gold standard for ad tech. It will be very disruptive and companies will need to like adjust and be agile about reviewing, you know, seeing how, how much, how effective campaigns are in different mediums and, and being able to shift dollars quickly into, into different um, segments that are, or different uh, techs that are, that's performing well. Um, I think it'll be really important to keep a close eye on that. Yeah, I, there's a part of me that believes that advertising is going to become more um, expensive because those people that have um, solved for this are going to be charging more. I also believe that um, a lot of companies, they're not going to be able maybe to spend this more because they're going to have to make the investment in, in their first party data collection and also mm -hmm. understanding what is the whole model of attribution now, because when third party go away, it's going to be more of a probability that they're going to convert, not a one-to-one -one, um, confirmation that they've converted. And so there's a lot of modeling outside of just the data collection, but also understanding from a marketing point of view, what is the, the, the attribution model so that you know what to reinvest in when it comes to marketing. So I actually think, well, for some some of the um, some people that we we rely on for those advertising networks, their prices are going to go up if they solve for how do I target. Um, I do think overall, though, the budgets are going to be reduced because people aren't going to know what to do, and that's going to give them a little bit of paralysis analysis analysis paralysis, and then they're going to also have to invest on their their own um, data mining and their own software there. Well said. Yeah. Definitely interesting to get thoughts on how you think that's going to play out. Um, great. Yeah. Well, anything to add, or should I move on to the next question? Just one one quick note. I think yeah. we've we've already seen uh, a little bit of this in highly regulated industries: banking, public sector, healthcare. Uh, they've they've already had to make this shift or started to make this shift. We can see their marketing mix change uh, as those regulations, even within those sectors, become even more enforced. So luckily we have from those industries and those sectors, we have a little bit of a model for what a, a future might look like. Excellent point. Definitely good to know more about that. Um, great. So our next question here is a bit of a case study. Uh, not sure we're going to you know, be able to dive too in depth today with the, uh, the time that we have, but I imagine the person who asked this is not the only one in the audience who may be experiencing something similar, so I want to make sure we address it. Uh, and that question is, uh, the person says, my company implemented the third-party cookie data two months ago, um, and our site view significantly dropped. Uh, it started on the day we installed the cookie plugin. Uh, how do you suggest still using cookies, but still capturing the site views on your pages, even if our customers are clicking, do not accept? 
does that option exist? Uh, would love to get thoughts on that. It's a bit complicated, I imagine. I can put on my implementation hat a little yeah. bit right now to talk about that. <laughs> I would say for this particular use case, you really want to dive into even even looking up the GDPR classifications of cookie types are going to be really key. Mm -hmm. um, they mm -hmm. This doesn't sound like a GDPR scenario. It sounds like a general cookie acceptance, but GDPR is so much more than our US-based cookie regulations, and it does give some guidance to define that you can have cookies that are functional site cookies in a distinct classification. Um, you have ad cookies that are your third-party ad ad capabilities. You have analytics based. So for example, Google Analytics is a third party tracking cookie. So if your customers, like in this scenario, if you have a generic yes or no, do not accept or accept cookies, and they say no, because that's scary. And you didn't tell me, I'm not really sure what's happening here. You've just blocked your Google Analytics from tracking any of that kind of customer behavior. And honestly, you could implement a CDP through a tag management system like Google Tag Manager and get it blocked by your cookie blocker as well, because maybe your CDP is using a collection beacon from a third party site. So looking into the way that their GDPR gives very clear guidance on the different types of classifications of cookies and then implementing in the in the implementation that our analytics tracking for our website is a core functionality of the site or maybe your location setting feature on your website is kind of a core website functionality really isn't an advertising cookie it's a functional cookie mm -hmm. exposing the classifications of cookies and implementing it with your cookie tracking software will, will give that visibility to con uh, the consumer to go oh okay i'm okay with this but i don't want you shipping my data off to you know remarketing visual right. ads that right. my kids need yeah. their christmas presents when they're <laughs> on the same network and <laughs> yeah. you know Know, the surprise is blown, you know, yep, so exactly. it's really just a, it's really just implementation, utilizing all of the available communication mechanisms to customers to give them that control visibility Absolutely. and then Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much for diving in uh, to the implementation portion there, Joanna. We are going to get cut off, so I want to make sure to say thank you uh, to everyone for being here today. Thank you to our sponsor, Acquia. Uh, to our audience, be sure to download the slides from the event resources area and check your link uh, to that for the link to um, check your email for the link to the on-demand recording, which will be available later today. Again, thank you all so much to our speakers. Have a great day. Thank you.